Good evening and welcome to another edition of Down to the Wire. I'm your host, Derbyologist, and joining me again as co-host, Capping with Candace. Candace here. And Candace, this week we go to the city of brotherly love, Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, for the annual Pennsylvania Derby card. And we're going to take a look at the pick three here, which comprises three stakes races all in a row, 8th, 9th, and 10th at Philadelphia Parks. And the first one is the Gallant Bob, a sprint stakes race at six furlongs. For the races that we're covering today, the kind of three stakes in a row, I found this race to be the most difficult. Um, I, I don't think there's really a skin out here, and I think a few of these might get overplayed coming out of the King's Bishop. Um, losing Liberal run really, really big there, but it was one of those races that they went so fast. Obviously, run happy on the lead. When you go that that kind of degree of speed, you get the field stretched out and you leave some of the back markers with too much to do. Um, I also think in that race in particular, there was, you and I discussed, there was a lot of horses in that race who wanted no part of seven furlongs, which you could kind of eliminate half that field before they even went in the gate because a lot of them just, they're six furlong horses. So, you know, while I, I expect Limousine Liberal to account himself well here, at five to two, I couldn't take him in this race, even on the cutback to six furlongs. Um, Graham Billy, I don't know totally what to do with him. I don't think he stayed the trip. Um, he did obviously have some troubles in the beginning at the gate. So there's you can build excuses for why he ran the way he did, but I'm not convinced he's going to jump back to form. I'm still concerned, as I was before, that his best races are at Gulfstream Park and that he doesn't seem to be able to transfer his form other places. So. For me, I ended up landing on the local kid, Trouble Kid, the number four here. Uh, he's won two in a row. He broke his maiden here at Parks in a $25,000 maiden claimer, but he won it by 16 and a half lengths. Came back, then ran at Delaware in a starter allowance, one by nine lengths. Is he good enough to fit with these? I have no idea, but I think he's pretty fast. And more importantly, you know, he seems to be... Um, a little bit tactical. I mean, he'll obviously be up on, like, near the lead, but I don't think he necessarily needs the lead. Um, but he just looks like a gritty fellow, and I wonder if being, you know, not having run at this level yet, if his price will drift a little bit. And if it does, that's great. I think, you know, these sprints, especially in the three-old division, is one of the divisions where you can see some horses like this make that class jump, jump because it's you're basically betting raw speed. Yeah, six furlong races are run differently than six and a half and seven. And sometimes just the power and the sprint speed will will be enough for a few of these horses. I do think the King's Bishop horses will probably be a little over bet just because, well, it's a grade one race and everybody is aware of it and everybody saw the race. So Limousine Liberal had shown some good sprinting power going into that race. I ain't going to really upgrade him or downgrade him from the race. If he's good enough, he can win. Um, Grand Billy, I think, ran actually fairly well in the King's Bishop. He just couldn't go seven. So I think the six furlong distance will help him a little bit better. And, and I think he can be ridden more aggressively at six. Whereas I think last time they, they were caught, oh, should we rate? Should we go? And then it didn't matter because Run Happy just kind of freaked on the front end anyways. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's the case that we see. And, you know, horse like Grand Billy, too, you wonder if, you know, if connections were concerned about him staying staying that seven for long trip, if you pull him back a little bit further than you think. You know, we'll talk about a route version of that later with I'm a Chatterbox in the Kentucky Oaks. I think there was concerns whether or not she'd stay. So, you know, your gut tells you to pull the horse further back, and sometimes you end up doing yourself, shooting yourself in the foot doing that too. Yeah, a horse that, you know, I did want to mention, he isn't my top pick, but I thought Cantina Red ran a couple of really nice races at Tampa Bay this spring. And then he, he kind of ran them off their feet last time at Seven Furlongs. Uh, it was a Florida restricted race, but I think he's proven that he's better than a Florida bred. I think he's going to do really well in this spot. And I like the fact that he comes in off a win at Seven Furlongs. Now he gets the cut back and, and you know, he's a son of Munnings. And Chad Stewart does well on the East Coast in some of these uh, races like this. Yeah, I know you and I talked about Catalina a lot, uh, Catalina read a lot when we were kind of discussing some of the initial derby preps out there in uh, Florida. And I, he's a tricky one for me in this race because I wonder what you do with him. Uh, I think he has been in races where he's benefited from being close to 
kind of fairly slow paces, and so he just sort of sits close and then makes one move and wins the race. I don't think the pace here is going to be slow, so I I don't totally know where he's going to sit uh, in this race. If he's going to be able to sit more forward like he has been when he wins, or if they're going to have to drop him back some. But it will be an interesting race to see, you know, the tactics that they use on him. But I, I, I think ultimately I wonder if this is a horse who is going to end up turf sprinting. Just because he doesn't, from what I've seen, he doesn't seem to have quite that raw dirt sprint speed. But he is effective at these sorts of trips. So I wonder if maybe down the road over the turf he'll, you know, kind of find his niche a little bit. Well, next year he'll be a four-year-old, and they don't have as many uh, restricted races for four-year-olds. So I think this is a good way to get him into open company without throwing him into a race like the King's Bishop or something like that. So I like the placement, and I think he's good enough to run in the top five. So to me, that's a good spot. I ended up going uh, with a horse called Recount in this race. He's got two of my favorite handicapping angles um, for getting prices. One is Polly to Dirt. And then the two is the cutback. So I thought he ran a gritty race at a mile the last time. He definitely faces faster horses here. He's definitely a little slower on paper. But as you know, I don't think speed figures are accurate on Polly. And so I don't think anybody really knows what he can run. I think he's capable of running an 85 to 90. And if Limousine Liberal and Grand Billy run a 95 or a 100, he won't win. But if they can't do that, I think recount... Uh, at eight nine to one fits in a race like this. I think he's a little bit of a wild card, and it's hard for any of us to gauge really what to expect from him because he went out guns blazing in Arlington Park and uh, back in August, setting very fast fractions on route to winning there. But we also know how that track is playing. I mean, there was a few weeks there in August where it didn't matter who you were, two to one shot, ninety two to one shot. If you got to the front, you were winning. So, you know, when you're coming off of a track that was quite that biased to that extent, you don't you don't really know, you know, how good the victory was. But nonetheless, it's probably a good fitness builder. And I would be interested in him underneath coming off of that cutback as well. The ninth race is the Cotillion. And this is a grade one race. So traditionally, it draws a good field. And Basically, the leaders in the division, uh, for the most part, are all here or for the horses that could maybe still be vying for some year-end awards. They are, and that's kind of nice to see. I know, you know, in the past, this race has typically been good. We had Untappable and Crew over here last year, so it's good to see, you know, similar quality horses coming here. Um, Pace-wise, I think it's fairly straightforward. You'd expect to take charge Brandy your British Cup Juvenile Phillies winner to go to the lead. She really only has one way to go, so that's where you would expect to see her. Um, I'm a Chatterbox has been more forwardly placed again, now coming out of the Kentucky Oaks, so you expect her to be up there, along with maybe Desert Valley. Calamity Kate also tends to be ridden forward, and then, you know, I wonder if some of these drawn outside, a horse like Eskin for Money might be pushed forward just because of the wide draw, or Don't Forget About Me. So. This, to me, on paper, looks like a race that you're going to see a pretty fast pace. Um, I I don't really foresee any, you know, avenue that this pace isn't, you know, on the fat, at least on the faster side of good. So, you know, I, I wanted, it, it's a tough race because I wanted to take somebody from off the pace because I foresee this pace being really fast, and I do foresee the potential of a meltdown in here, but at the same time, I think that class kind of reigns supreme, and the class horse in this race is I'm a chatterbox. She should win this race. Um, she is tactical. She has versus versatile from a tactics perspective. If you can just pull her back that little bit, not way to the back, but you know mid pack or so, she should win this race. She should just be better than these. Um, as far as horses underneath. I wouldn't be completely opposed to saying Peace and War can get second or third, Pangburn can get second or third, um, you know, from horses who might benefit from this very fast pace, but on top it, it really should be I'm a Chatterbox. Yeah, I'm not sold yet if the pace is going to be fast. I just know it's going to be contested, and I know there's a clear couple of horses that can only run on the lead. 
Uh, so that's why I'm not a big fan of Embellish the Lace. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of Calamity Kate, even. I'm not a fan of Keen Pauline. I just think they have only one way to win, and I really think all of their big wins are kind of bogus wins, and they're not really grade one horses. I'm a Chatterbox is the best horse, and she can rate a little bit, but something just says... I don't know, my spidey sense is coming up and that she probably won't win and just settle for another tough luck second or third again. Um, so I'm going with Pangburn. Um, I do think Peace and War also just because she's a plotter and I, I just want the plotters in this race. And, yeah. and so I guess I'd go with lean towards one of those two. I'm going to go with Pangburn, um, but I'm definitely, I just know I'm a chatterbox is better than Embellish the Lace mm -hmm. and Keen Pauline. Uh, so I can't take one of those two horses. Tara's Tango is very interesting. Just because she, you know, she only has five races. Um, they kind of rushed her this winter to get her ready for the Kentucky Oaks. And then when that didn't work out, they kind of regrouped and then really started working her out. And she had a nice prep. So the only problem is every once in a while, parks can get tricky uh, inside post positions. Yeah. And you just never know how it's going to play. Last year it was fine and it actually was speed bias. Last year was where you out. wanted to be, yeah. So I, 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 that's why I'm not picking Tara's Tango, but I do think there's a little bit of upside. At least I, I don't think she's a fluke. Like I, I just really think Keen Pauline was a fluke, yeah. and I really think Embellish the Lace was a fluke. Yeah, and Tara's Tango has, you know, consistently put races together. I mean, yeah, we look back now and say, okay, well maybe Enchanting Lady isn't that good or whatever. But at the time, she was good, and she finished second to Fantastic Style, who came back and blew him away at Losal. Second to Stellar Win, well, we know how good she is. And then now came last time and beat Yana and Melanistic in an allowance race. So she does, I agree that she seems to be a horse trending upward. I think for me, the way I would attack this race is, you know, I I think I'm going to try to box this best, so I'm going to key her on top. And then I don't want any of the other surprises. Like I said, I want Pangburn. I want Peace and War. I want even like a horse like Stroke Play wouldn't shock me if, to, you know, finish second or third. I want all the bombs from the back underneath I'm a chatterbox. So, you know, I think you have to, if you like any of the standout, like of the horses who we expect to be short places, you need to pick one of them and then, you know, go from there. If you're starting to use too many of them, well, then you're, you're putting yourself in a bad position to lose money. The horse I want to talk about is Take Charge Brandy. Neither one of us picked her and, and really discussed her. You know, this it, it's a tough read. From a handicapping standpoint, uh, I can't pick her. I just, I didn't like, you know, she was obviously injured, and so she was off, and she was off longer than they originally said that she was going to be off. Um, all along, I never really thought she'd be a great mile and an eighth or mile and a sixteenth type horse anyways. Um, but then again, my spidey sense is up because this is what Lucas loves. He loves to lose by 20 lengths and win the next race. He's been doing it for 30 years. This is what he does. You can't look at – he loves to dirty up form, and he doesn't have a problem with losing by 30 lengths because he goes into these races, and I don't know if it's on purpose, but he's been doing this for 30 years. Like, he somehow has a way of telling the jock, like, if you lose by 30, I don't care. Yeah, and you just – I think with her, my big thing was just visually how she looked in that race was unlike how she's looked in any of her races to date. She just, she really, really struggled, just wasn't there at all. Um, and there was no excuse. I mean, maybe her, you know, one really bad race to date was back in the Adirondack where there was a lot of excuses. She was acting up and being crazy, you know, on the parade and when they were loading in the gate. So I don't really see that here. I mean, I, I think she looked bad. Physically, not not that she wasn't fit, but she if you remember she was really sweating up. She was very washed out before they even got her in the gate. So, you know, maybe something was going wrong there, but it just was it was almost too bad to be true. I think I sit here thinking, you know, have the others passed her by? If she you know, she had her time as a juvenile, you know, not necessarily that she got worse, but everybody else got better and have they have they really passed her by? Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what I'm doing, but I don't have really any, I mean, the problem is, is when you just think that everybody else has passed a horse like that by, that's just an opinion. So yes. uh, on form, you know, there's something still in the back of my head that just knows this is what he likes to do. I'm tossing the horse, but I'm tossing it just because of my opinion on well, paper. Well, maybe, maybe she'll come back somewhere else. I mean, if you're going to even go just on paper, well, on paper, she, to me, looks pace compromised, so. Yeah. 
So, I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I won't totally write her off yet because this is what he, he doesn't have a problem with losing. Like, I can see her losing by 20 again and then winning the spinster because that's what he likes to do. I mean, yeah. he doesn't, he doesn't take losses at face value. And like I say, he's, he's a master at this and, and that's kind of what he does over the years. Uh, the Pennsylvania Derby, the city of brotherly love. And last year it was Bairn who uh, went wire to wire in this race. Uh, this year, it drew a couple of big horses from the Haskell and the Travers, which is unusual. And then it drew a couple of up-and-comers. So kind of a, a couple of groups of horses in this race. It did. So it's a good mix of who's hot now and who, you know, has the class. Um, a few of these, I guess I would say the horse I'm incredibly against here is Island Town. I've never been a fan of this horse. Both of his races now have been over very, very, very speed by his tracks where he was on the lead the whole way. His last race in particular, just, I mean, go watch that race at Parks. It visually was just awful. It's one of those races you can watch and you know in that moment that this was just a bad, bad race. Nobody showed up there. You know, the one horse he was uh, on paper supposed to have to deal with was Divining Rod who did absolutely nothing at all. I couldn't take Island Town here, and he's 10 to 1 on the Warren line. It wouldn't surprise me at all if he ended up shorter than this. So he's one who I don't want. War Story I don't want because you have to factor in that he's going to miss the break by, you know, a length every single time. That's not going to change, so I don't want that either. Um, you know, really a race like this, you look at it and you say, okay, Frosted, Upstart, those should be the classes. He's in here, but... Frosted especially, you have to think that Travers took something out of him. I mean, for him to show up here is a good sign, but I I just, I can't expect him to replicate that performance here. That was enormous from him. I think you could make a strong case that, you know, he, he ran a better race than Keen Ice even. I just, I could not take him. Oh, the don't be dissing the Keen Ice fans like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, be nice, run good. I, I think it was for me personally. I think Pharaoh Frost is really clearly the two best. But the point is, they went so so hard there out front. I I do think it probably took something out of Frosted. If if Frosted is who he typically is, he should win this race no problem. But I'm not going to play it that way. I'm going to go with our good buddy Mr. Z on the outside. He's ten to one morning line. I love that price. I don't know if we'll get it, but I think we'll get something fair with both Upstart and Frosted in there. Uh, I could care less about the Kings Bishop. He was never going to win that race. I said on here last week, Mr. Z wins when he gets one thing, a lone lead. He was never going to get that in the Kings Bishop. You know, Mr. Z's a horse who, you know, physical talent is totally there. It's his head that's all wonkety. So he needs that lone lead. I think, you know, that provides him some mental soundness in these races. He's going to get that here if he wants it. So, breaking from the outside, you know they're pushing forward, too. So, Mr. Z taking the Pennsylvania Derby. Yeah, you know, I you know I think the two horses that will be bet on class are Frosted and Upstart. And then you've got the rising four-race winning streak guy, Gimme Dilute. Now, you don't really mention him. My opinion of him is those last two races were just walkovers. Whenever a horse is one to five in a race, it's not a race. It's just a workout. Um, those were Calbred races. He's had some other gritty wins. I don't think it has anything to do with outside of California. I think that seems to be the, the subliminal message. And he actually had rough trips in both his races when he went east. I just don't think he's good enough. No. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a big Gimme the Loot fan. No. Uh, made from Lucky, I think he kind of just is who he is. He can run a 90-speed figure. And if Frosted and Upstart don't bring a 95 to the table, I actually think Made from Lucky is capable of winning the race. Yeah. And then Mr. Z is kind of, you know, you know, going into the turn, he's going to be on the lead and he's gritty. And so I think he's usable. I, I can't use any of the other horses. Um, Iron Fist, you know, he was stuck in a no, everybody knew the rail was dead on West Virginia Derby Day. Yes. And he did get stuck there. He's had five nice workouts since then. But this horse just gets overplayed for one reason, because he was purchased for $1.5 million. And mm -hmm. that's irrelevant. It is, and, you know, he, like it's another one. He's 8 to 1 on the morning line, but this year in his races, he's gone off. 7 to 5, 4 to 5, 2 to 5, 5 to 2. He ain't going to be 81. You have to yeah, know that. You know. And he's got Mike Smith, and he's got Jerry Hollendorfer. And, oh, yeah, everything. And, tap it. Yeah. So tap it, and they love that. So um, what's kind of your take on Gimme Dilute and Made from Lucky? 
I agree with you completely about Nathan Lucky. He's very consistent. He just has a mark that he runs to every single time. You know, like, when he gets in races where that's a winning mark, he wins. And when he doesn't, he doesn't. Um, I, he's not improving. He's not getting worse. He's just kind of always been the same thing all year long. And, you know, the softer races, he wins. And when he's against Farrow and crew, he doesn't. So I, I'm, I think there's a couple in here that are better than him. But he is one who I, I also, at the same time, wouldn't be surprised if his price drifted up a little bit. And if you can get 6, 7, 8 to 1, well, then, then he becomes usable to me. Um, give me the loot. I don't think he's good enough. I think he's great at what he is in these Calvary restricted races over, you know, Del Mar and San Anita. Um, he's going to take money because he's won four races in a row and people know the horses. They, they'll, you know, they'll look and they'll say, well, Prospect Park, he's won since then. I'll be on the turf. Oh, um, he's won since then. Yeah, that's the turf too. Um, you know, and last time he beat Thaman Power, who I think is disappointed. So they're... There just isn't a lot there. There isn't anything from him that stands out to me to thinking, oh, he's you know really really good and he can beat these because this is this is a, je a step up in class for him and I think a pretty big one. Yeah, and I don't like the fact that he faced four, six, five, and four horse fields the last four races either. So, um, you know, ultimately I got it down to Frosted and Upstart. I'm going to be the the sucker that picks Frosted. I. I would like to see one of those two horses win. Um, I mean, it's just kind of sad because, you know, Keen Ice finally got that win, and if Frosted can't get a win in a spot like this, it's just it's just the way it is. And, and sometimes that's just the way it works out. A good horse just can never really find it. And even though this race, he's got a couple of horses that he's, I mean, he's clearly better than like a war story in an island town and some of those guys. I just... You know, I could just see him getting into a prolonged battle with Mr. Z, and, and, and that doesn't work out in Frosted's flavor. Um, I'd actually be more tempted to really hope that Upstart could actually go back and run his Haskell race, because I think that could win this race. I like the fact that Upstart was competitive all the way around in the Travers. What people don't forget was, is, you know, he was in the top four all the way around. He nice passed him late, but actually Upstart was closer to the pace for that first two, three calls. Yes. And I think his Travers is a lot better than people think. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to pick Frosted just because I think he is the better horse. But to me, this could be a Dutch race where I play Frosted and Upstart. And I just have a sneaky feeling, Gimme Duluth's going to take a lot of money and Upstart's the horse that's going to drift up to six, seven to one because Iron Fist will take some money. And I wouldn't mind Upstart winning to, that'll be the horse that I make money on. Frosted is just the horse to get my money back on. Yeah, and I, I you know, for me personally, I am very tempted to play a Mr. Z Upstart exact to just box them. I think, I agree with you that Upstart ran really well in the Travers. And he's always been a horse that, you know, that, that 10 furlongs has been kind of suspect. So 10 furlongs over Saratoga is a testing one, especially with the pace now. You're cutting them back to nine. Parks is, you know, a little bit faster track. I think a lot of those things could play into his favor as well. I guess I'm a little more skeptical of you, of anyone going up and engaging Mr. Z. I, I just still think people don't take him seriously. You know, it's different than Farrell, where Farrell goes to the lead and they know, okay, somebody's going to get him. Otherwise, it's over. I don't think people look at Mr. Z in the same way, so I wouldn't be surprised if a horse like Upstart or horse like Frost, it goes forward, but maybe just sits right behind Mr. Z. And that's a dangerous spot to be, leave him there. Well, Gimme Dilute has enough speed to run seven furlongs. I'm hoping Gimme Dilute mm -hmm. is near the pace. I just don't think Gimme Dilute can go nine furlongs. No. Um, so, but his speed figures show that he really should be pressing the pace at the mile mark. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if he doesn't, then, you know, Mr. Z can take him a long way. And then depending on how the track is playing. If it's playing like last year, uh, speed will be the place to be. Um, if it playing two years ago, or maybe it was three years ago now, the inside was just dead. So it was all outside sweeping moves all day long. So um, parks can get a little, you know, and some of it's the track surface, and some of it's just this time of the year. It gets cool and at night and in the mornings, and then they, uh, so we'll see how the track is kind of playing. But I do think Mr. Z is playable 8, 9 to 1. I think Upstart is going to be 7 to 1 is playable. Um, Frosted isn't really playable, but to me, if he's 8 to 5, 2 to 1, at least you can get your money back on him. And I just can't play uh, Made from Lucky just because I don't think he's good enough. Give me Duluth. 
I think is going way up in class. Yeah. And then um, the other horse that I'm kind of anti against here is Island Town, but um, you know, he could go either way. I mean, I assume since he won by six lengths and he has popular connections, he'll be kind of bet a little bit. And I think Iron Fist always seems to get bet somehow, somewhere. It does seem that way. You know, I think if this race really just hinges on, does anybody engage Mr. Z? I think pushing the pace to make it past, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's just somebody going to go up there and actively engage him, and whether or not they do is going to tell us, you know, the story of this race. Yeah, and I think the others really are just, I'm not sure where they fit. You know, Battle of Midway just, you know, he's lost four races in a row by over 40 lengths. War Stories lost six races in a row and gets the rail. Um, plus, he breaks slow. I just don't think that's good for him. And, and Tommy Macho, you know, I, for some reason, I didn't like him going into the West Virginia Derby, but... He ran so bad in that race. Actually, I don't think he's that bad. So I, no. I'm not picking him. I don't, you know, but it wouldn't surprise me if you finished third, fourth, fifth, and actually made a little bit of a move in this race. I just kind of tossing out that West Virginia Derby. Yeah, no, I did not. That's the, that was the story of the West Virginia Derby, I think, was the horses who we thought would win all running incredibly bad, like maybe career worst efforts. And Tommy Macho was certainly one of those, you know. Right before that, in the Dwyer, he was five lengths behind Spadester, two and a half lengths behind Texas Red. That's decent enough form. If he can find that again, you know, he can have a presence here, but and maybe the distance is a little bit of a concern. Yeah, distance is a little bit of a concern, but he does get Castellano, and like I say, his other, like, I think he's going to be 15 to 1, and he really, you know, like, he has a, a better chance. Like, I like him much better than an Iron Fist or even oh, a mate yeah. from Lucky in this spot. But yeah. it, it may not matter if uh, Frosted and Upstart and Mr. Z run their good races. So uh, should be interesting of the three races. Um, you know, I, I you know, I really, like I say, I think it's going to be tough for Emma Chatterbox. I'd like to see her win. I think that's a tough race. And I, and I think this is a good challenge for Frosted because if he wins... He can train for six weeks up to the Breeders' Cup Classic. If he loses, they'll just rest up for the Dubai because at some point with a horse like this, you just can't keep putting him into races where he's going to lose, and, and that's kind of where Frost is at. He either has to step up and win, or he, you know, he just needs to be given a little bit of a break and maybe Dubai, and they can give him a nice little easy prep in Dubai yes. and then really point him towards the Dubai World Cup. Yeah, and I mean, he's the type who would fit well in those races, obviously owned by Godolphin, so it wouldn't be anything shocking for him to go there. And he's kind of a grindy type that could do well out there. Um, I think for me, I'm most excited by the Pennsylvania Derby, just because, like I said, I'm pretty bullish on Mr. Z. But I think overall, the good thing about, you know, it, I know Clarks can be a little bit debatable, people betting it or not, because the takeout is very high. But if you are someone who's thinking of betting the races, I, I do would think that at least this year provides for a much more competitive card. You know, last year we got the untappable to Bayern, a double, which was fine, but I think it was pretty clear, at least on paper, that those were the horses that should be winning most races. So at least this year provides a little more intrigue and maybe some more betting opportunities. Yeah, you know, the, the, the takeout is what the takeout is. Um, and that'll be solved eventually mm -hmm. just by attrition or whatever. But, um, you know, I still like having a circuit. I mean, I think some people still think the answer is to run at Belmont 100 days a year and Keeneland 100 days a year and Santa Anita 100 days a year. And you're not going to develop horse racing fans if you don't have horse racing circuits. So whether Phil, I mean, do I think Philadelphia Park should run 300 days a year? No. But I do think they should run 20 and it should be part of an East Coast circuit because, I do think you see horses, some horses like certain tracks better than others, and I do think it, it adds to the handicapping puzzle. I really don't want to see Frosted and Mr. Z run against each other seven straight times at Belmont. I just don't think that's fun. So I do think different tracks kind of add to the puzzle. I think so, too, and I do think, you know, for the people out there in Pennsylvania parks, they're, they're doing some good things. They're doing plenty of good things, you know, and we'll see in time if the takeout issue gets solved, but you know they're doing great things to get big competitive fields for large purses. I mean, they're a track that on any given day, they, you know, their five thousand dollar claimers are a hell of a lot better than anywhere else's. That's for sure. So, 
I, I'm glad they have a meeting, you know, with the, you know, big stakes day. And I generally think that's the case. I mean, I know even tracks like Charlestown, people get mad that they have their big day and stuff, but I'm, you know, I'm the person who I, I actually like going to the small tracks on their big days. It's my favorite. I like going to those more than the, you know, I've been to the Derby, I've been to Breeders' Cups and my favorite days are Indiana Derby Day or Sutherland Derby Day. I like these kinds of days. I think you know, the, the small tracks really seem to appreciate it because it's not the norm for them. And a lot of times you get nice, big, competitive fields. So I'm, I'm excited for these races. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, people, people just kind of forget, forget that, you know. I mean, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, I mean, this is a market of four or five million. That's why it's sad not to have a meet at uh, Massachusetts and Boston. That's another market of five million people. Arlington Park, that's a mil Chicago is the third largest city in America. Like, you have to have race. If you don't have racetracks and, and big races at these places, you're, you know, that's 20 million fans a year that will never be exposed to horse racing, and you ain't going to grow unless you're exposed to that type of market. Yeah, and especially when you're trying to grow the sport. I mean, we all love the racing in Kentucky, at Keeneland, at Kentucky Downs, and, you know, maybe a little bit more for just the tradition side for Churchill, but you're not trying to expand the market in Kentucky. You have that market. It's these other places where you need to grab fans, and if you don't have tracks there, and if you don't have race meetings that bring, you know, some more of the big names over, then it's not going to happen. Should be an interesting card. And then next week we go back to Belmont for their big fall festival uh, racing. And then there's also some big races at Santa Anita. So uh, next week you may have to pack a lunch because we've got five or six races to handicap. So I might have to uh, eat a sandwich on air between. Yep, yep. Candace will have to eat a sandwich on air and have a little fruit juice and uh, a cookie snacker. She might have to get a Happy Meal or prepare yeah. a Happy Meal for the, for the broadcast next week. Uh, that's going to do it for another edition of Down